So my name is Jamie Baum and I'm an associate professor within the Division of Agriculture and I direct the Center for Human Nutrition and I'm joined today by an everyday for DEFEND by Dr. Aaron Howey who's in um, directs the exercises medicine program is in, in the College of Health, Human Performance and Recreation. I always forget which H it start with, starts with. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And we'll go ahead and get started. So today I'm going to talk to everyone, to you all about, um, hold on a sec, let me stop my video so the streaming's okay, about understanding dietary protein. So this will be more about what is dietary protein and what role does it play in the body. And then this will be followed next week by a guest speaker from UAMS who came out of Purdue University and will talk about the science of high protein diets. Oops. So um, most of the information came from a nutrition textbook, Nutrition for a Changing World. Um, and the objectives today are to really understand the difference between essential amino acids and non-essential amino acids. This is important because it relates to the quality of the different proteins we eat. Um, talk a little bit about protein digestion and absorption. Talk about the differences between high quality and low quality protein in some different food sources and understand the recommended protein intake for um, a given individual. And so some of this information you may have heard in Defend 1.0 or um, in other presentations I've given for extension, but um, hopefully there's some new information too. So this is supposed to be interactive, but I think it's easier if I just say, what do you think about when you hear the word protein? So when I talk about this with undergrads um, or graduate students at the U of A, you often hear things like the food we eat, muscle, uh, weight loss, like high protein diets and supplements. Um, but there's a reason that protein's so important and um, hopefully understanding these benefits will um, help you understand this topic better. So a lot of us, when we think about a high protein meal, we really think about you know, steak and potatoes and they th people think that this is what the serving of meat should look like. But in reality, what we should eat looks more like this picture on the right. So half your plate should be fruits or vegetables, um, and then a quarter protein and a quarter whole grains. So we're a little bit skewed in what a serving size of protein is. But proteins have many critical roles in the body. So they're enzymes, so they help with the chemical reactions in our body. They transport things around the body and move things in and out of the cell. Our hormones are made from proteins. It's important for structure and movement. Proteins help keep the acid-base balance in our body. Um, it's important for fluid balance. So protein regulates the distribution of fluids through different compartments of the body. And proteins are what makes up antibodies, which is important for our immunity. So protein itself makes up around 20 to 50% of the dry mass of an adult human body. So this is just a um, dual x-ray uh, absorptometry scan, so a DEXA scan. And you can see all these areas that are pinkish and red, these are our lean tissues, and a lot of that is where the protein in, in our body comes from. So amino acids, these are the building blocks of protein. So I talk about amino acids too, because if you go to the supplement aisle of any grocery store or um, any supplement store, you'll see a lot of like protein supplements, but you'll also see the different amino acids um, sold in supplement form. And so an amino acid, there are 20 different amino acids. And what makes them unique is that Compared to fats and carbohydrates, they have an amino group, but, or a group that contains nitrogen on it. They also have an acid group, so that's why they're called amino acid. And then they have a side chain. So this part here is what makes the 20 different amino acids different. And um, these 20 amino acids make up more than 22,000 different proteins in our body. So we have nine amino acids that are essential. So this means they can't be produced by the body. We have to get them through our diet. And we have 11 amino acids that are non-essential. So this means that our body can make them. And then this is the list of the essential amino acids and the non-essential amino acids. 
And I won't go through each one, but these are important because it's the ratio of essential amino acids that's present in the protein you eat um, that makes up the quality of the protein. And when we talk about things like muscle mass, or you may hear a lot of people who are bodybuilders, they really are interested in like the isoleucine, leucine, and valine. These are the branch chain amino acids. Um, at the gym I used to go to, they always called them BC. AAs, but um, often the people selling them didn't know what that meant. So these are the, just the different 20 amino acids. So you can see they all differ in structure. Um, and these amino acids, so the sequence of these amino acids, they're put together in a chain to make up the different proteins in the body. After this chain is made, then our body folds them into a particular shape. And it's this chain or the sequence of the amino acids plus the shape of the protein that it's folded into that determine the function of the protein in the body. So protein, we have proteins that give strength and elasticity to body parts. So these would be strings of amino acids that coil together and form rope-like structures. So you may see pictures of like muscle or things on the internet. That's where these rope-like fibers would be. Proteins like the ones that circulate in our blood, they're water soluble, which means they can mix with water and they form more of like a globe shape, like a ball of steel wool. Um, and then some proteins are shaped like hollow balls and they can carry minerals inside to transport them to where our body needs it. Other are providing support to tissues and they can also be the enzymes that act on substances to change them chemically. But proteins can also be denatured, and this changes then the shape and the function of the protein. So denaturation can be caused by heat, light, changes in pH, alcohol, or movement. And it's really important in the digestion of um, protein. So you would see here that this would be maybe a normal functional protein, this folded mass right here. And then pepsin, this is an enzyme in our stomach that's... Um, going to denature this protein to change its shape. So you can see it will cause it to become denatured and unfolded. And then this unfolded protein will bind a pepsin um, and break, it, and this pepsin breaks it down into shorter protein um, strands, so into um, smaller amino acid pieces. And an example of denaturation of protein occur, also occurs as part of food preparation and cooking. So one example is the egg. So as we cook an egg, we can see protein being denatured by the change in color and structure of the white and the egg yolks. So it's the denaturing of those proteins. So digestion of protein, it really begins in the stomach and is completed in the small intestine. So there is a little bit of digestion that happens in our mouth, and this is um, just the breaking down with our teeth. But really, it's when the you know, or when the proteins hit our stomach and the hydrochloric acid um, breaks down and denatures protein into these polypeptide fragments, so these smaller fragments of proteins. And then once they enter the small intestine, they're able to be broken down even further into small amino acid chains. And then this is what crosses our intestine and then enters into our bloodstream. So, um, so that's why it's important for protein quality because really once we put it in our mouth, it's the amino acid sequence and the availability of the amino acids in the source of protein that becomes important for absorption through the small intestine. So proteins in our body are constantly being broken down and reassembled in a process called protein turnover. So it's just the cycle of breaking down and building new proteins. So it's protein synthesis and then protein breakdown. And, um, this is what we really study in my lab. And so if protein intake isn't enough to replace the amino acids we lose by making new proteins in our body, we'll have protein breakdown, or to, to break down the amino acids that we need to keep our body going. And so basically every time we eat, we're supplying amino acids into this amino acid pool to hopefully help keep um, this balance. Um, so the, these amino acids that we eat, they can be synthesized in, to make new proteins. They can be broken down as a source of energy. So when we think of protein in terms of higher protein diets, 
One reason you always um, see people increasing protein and decreasing carbohydrates in a lot of this research is because they're equal in calories. So one gram of protein is four calories a gram and one gram of carbohydrate is also four calories a gram. So they can be used for energy, but they can also be made into glucose or fat if we have them enough, too many calories and we're consuming everything in excess. So really we talked about um, as they're broken down, if they're not being made into new proteins, that nitrogen is removed and will come out in our urine. So urea, the com component of our urine has nitrogen in it. And then the carbon and, um, that's left, that can be used to burn calories, to keep our bodies going for glucose or for fat. So anyone who watches like survival TV um, and things like that are places where they're dropped you know, without any food or water, one reason they're so focused on protein is because they need that protein to replenish the proteins in their body, and then that protein can also be used for multiple purposes. So protein balance can also be called nitrogen balance. So if we were working more, um, like in the research lab, we would talk about nitrogen balance. And this indicates whether the body is gaining, losing, or keeping the protein. And these are how the dietary guidelines for protein intake were established on the bare minimum of protein needed to maintain this balance in our body. So the balance would be like the amount of nitrogen we consume versus the amount of nitrogen we excrete. Oops. And that excretion can be in the urine or fecal matter, sweat, in our skin, hair, nails, etc. So this is um, actually kind of an old figure that has made it 20 years since my start of my PhD. But on average, we know that the average American is consuming around 90 to 100 grams of protein per day. So you would consume it. It would mix with all the digestive juices and the cells in your intestine. That contributes another 70 grams per day into your pool. It goes through your small intestine. And so of this 170 grams that are going into our system every day, our blood will absorb about 160 grams of these amino acids that have been broken down from these proteins, and we lose around 10 grams per day as fecal matter. Um, then this becomes an amino acid pool, so we may take it to make more um, muscle. It could be to regenerate you know, tissue turnover, red blood cell turnover. Um, we lose two grams of protein per day in our skin. So um, I always find that one kind of interesting. And then we lose around 90 grams of this nitrogen, oops, in the form of urine. So the urea or amino acid. So per day, we're breaking down and building around 300 grams of protein. So when you're in positive nitrogen balance, this means you have an increase in total body protein. So this could be, you know, you're growing. So a lot of children um, are in positive nitrogen balance because you're in a growth phase. Maybe you're like building more muscle, you're lifting weights. That would be a positive nitrogen balance. And it's this positive nitrogen balance that we try to achieve through diet and exercise to see some of these beneficial effects of higher protein diets. Um, you could be in nitrogen balance or nitrogen equilibrium, which means what you're taking in and what you're excreting are the same. So this means that um, your body weight and your lean body mass, so the protein in your body aren't changing, and protein synthesis and protein breakdown are equal. Um, and so you're not losing muscle or you're not gaining muscle. And so sometimes when we talk about high protein diets in terms of weight loss, one of the reasons we think um, that they're successful is that they target maintaining your, your lean body mass, so your skeletal muscle and um, protein mass, and they target fat, lo fat loss. Because I think it's also important to remember you don't really get more muscle protein without um, some sort of resistance exercise or physical activity. You really, um, diet can only help you maintain protein synthesis or maintain the protein in your body and then provide the substrates to build more proteins in response to exercise. And then we have negative nitrogen balance. So this is when we decrease total body protein. So um, negative nitrogen balance often occurs as we age. So we're excreting more um, nitrogen than we're taking in. 
And this happens, I think around age 30 to 40, we all start losing a little bit of skeletal muscle mass every year. And this continues with age, unless you're adjusting for it with diet or physical activity. Um, and so as our, we lose muscle mass, we become more frail. We are at more risk for developing diseases like diabetes or heart disease. So a lot of the research in my lab, and I think a lot of the research that will pre be presented next week, and even Dr. Borsheim who presented on fat, she studies um, ways to either keep people in nitrogen balance or increase nit or have positive nitrogen balance to avoid losing our body proteins. So protein in intake recommendations, I, this says the Institute of Medicine here, but this is an outdated slide. It should be the National Academy of Medicine. They recently changed their name. It re recommends that adults get a minimum of 0.8 grams or um, of protein for every kilogram. So this should be kilogram or 2.2 pounds of body weight per day, but it's really your ideal body weight. So what should your ideal body weight be for your age and height? And you wanna aim to have about 0.8 grams of protein. And this is just to stay in this equilibrium or balanced state. Um, so we as protein scientists say that this 0.8 grams is the minimum amount of protein we need each day. And this translates to about eight grams of protein for every 20 pounds of body weight. But there's also another way the recommendations are framed and that's called the acceptable macronutrient distribution range. So this is more of a range saying that you can have 10 to 35% of your total out calorie intake from protein. And a lot of the people who are protein scientists like myself, we work within this range where a normal protein diet would be around 10 to 15% and a higher protein diet would be around 30 to 35% of your calories. So we do know that most Americans do eat um, enough protein. In fact, they eat more than the dietary guidelines for protein, but we're not just eating protein, we're eating a lot of everything. So um, really where people start to see the health benefits is when they start to you know, reduce calories, but also reduce the amount of carbohydrates in their diet. So more than 60% of protein consumed in the United States comes from animal products. And you can see typical protein intake for an American is in these, are these red bars and the recommended dietary intake are in these purple bars. And you can see starting from age one, we consume more protein than is recommended. But we do have decreased protein intake uh, with age. And then these are just the different sources of protein. So you can see a lot of it is um, meat, poultry, fish, or dairy products. And then you know, the remainder is made up from you know, beans, nuts, soy, vegetables, and grain products. And I left this in here for those of you who wanna come back to these slides to show what um, different portions that provide about eight grams of protein. So this also shows protein of Americans. I know this figure on the left is a little bit blurry. So this is from the Centers for Disease Control. And this data ends at 2008, but I think what's important to notice here is that our protein intake has remained relatively the same, around 15 to 16% for both men and women. And we even notice in our lab, when we analyze diet records from both children and adults, um, just freely living and recording what they eat, that protein intake tends to be around 16%. And then we give people even protein supplements, it seems that they compensate in other places of their diet by reducing protein, and they still have the 16% of calories from protein intake. And what we would argue is that actually your carbohydrate intake should move closer to 40%, and your protein intake should be closer to 30%. So this just also, this figure on the right comes from the dietary guidelines from 2015. So we should be getting new dietary guidelines sometime this year or early next year. And it shows in blue the recommended weekly intake and the actual average weekly intake. So you can see meat, poultry, and eggs for males, especially you know, in early to mid adulthood is well above the um, recommended intake. Females tend to be right on par with recommendations. All Americans consume less seafood than recommended, and we're not super great with nuts, seeds, and soy products. We also know that of this around 90 to 100 grams of protein we eat each day, um, it's actually skewed towards dinner. So what this shows you on the right 
is the um, where protein is coming from based on population data. Oops. And you can see breakfast, we all tend to eat around 10 grams of protein per, for breakfast. I think this oops, comes from you know, the high consumption of breakfast cereals. We eat a little more protein with lunch and then most of our protein intake is at dinner. So when we're talking about maximum protein synthesis, and we're really talking about this in terms of skeletal muscle because our re my research and research of others really thinks that you know, the healthier the muscle, the healthier the person, we would argue that you would need to evenly distribute your protein between breakfast, lunch, and dinner to have this optimum muscle protein synthesis response because you need around 25 to 30 grams of protein to increase muscle protein synthesis above muscle protein breakdown especially as we age. Um, we know that adults older than the age of 65 particularly benefit from higher protein intake. And we would argue that protein intake of 1.2 grams per kilogram body weight versus the 0.8 is beneficial because it reduces loss of lean body mass, improves function, reduces risk of disability and death. It becomes particularly effective with resistance exercise. Um, and maximized with an, you can maximize it and then also emphasize consuming plant-based foods. And this is a lot for heart health as well as we, when we age. And that's one reason that Project Defend is it's both diet and exercise because really you can improve your diet, but more and more research is so, showing that without exercise, you're not gonna maximize the health benefits. And this is just showing that example where I told you where we do start to lose muscle mass with age with a 20 year old physically active female, oops, and a height and weight matched woman, sedentary woman in their 60s. And you can see all this white part around these darker areas is muscle loss associated with age. And so a lot of times we get questions, do athletes need more protein? Um, and in truth, Athletes don't really need more protein. We all build and break down around 300 grams of protein per day. Um, and what makes people like these elite athletes like Michael Phelps really successful is really a lot of it's genetics. They have identified genes that um, make people more likely to be elite athletes than the rest of us, training and, and diet, and they may benefit from optimal protein intake for performance advantage around 1.2 to 1.7 grams per kilogram body weight. And so then, well, so what type of protein should we eat? And you may hear things about protein quality, plant-based proteins, eat, have meatless Mondays. Um, so it's becoming more and more discussed, especially, you know, with things like the incognito burger and impossible burger. So what's the difference between, you know, a plant protein and an animal source of protein? Um, so there's three categories of proteins and it's all based on the proportion of this essential amino acids. So I mean, these essential amino acids are what we talked about in the beginning. So the amino acids your body can't make on its own. So we have complete proteins, which contain all nine essential amino acids. Incomplete proteins, which lack one or more of the essential amino acids, and then complementary proteins. So this is when you would combine two incomplete proteins to make a complete protein. So one example you'll always see are like beans and rice. So beans are missing one amino acid and rice is missing another amino acid, but when you combine them together, it becomes a complete protein. The same with like peanut butter and whole wheat bread. So if you do, if you are a vegan or a vegetarian and you follow a plant-based diet, you can meet your protein needs. You just have to make sure you're consuming a wide variety of these plant-based proteins so that you're meeting this essential amino acid profile. Um, you also want to choose proteins that boost fiber and limit saturated fat intake. So these are just examples in purple of the protein content, red is saturated fat, and then blue are the healthy fats and green are fiber of different protein sources. So you can see um, like things like hot dogs, cheddar cheese, 80% um, ground beef. They all have the same amount of protein per gram, but they have a lot more saturated fat here versus some of the plant-based things. I mean, what is missing here are things like poultry, fish, and really lean ground beef, because you would see that they actually have low saturated fat and are um, good choices of, of protein. So what does protein in different serving sizes look like? Well, a large egg has around six grams protein. 
100 grams of salmon, which is about three ounces, has 22 grams of protein, three ounces of chicken, 28 grams. Um, a serving of lentils has eight grams, and this is about an ounce of cheese, has around seven grams of protein. So what does that mean in terms of calories? Because in the United States, you know, especially even in Arkansas and across the country, where 70% of Americans are overweight or have obesity. So we don't even, we don't just need to focus on protein content because we know Americans eat enough protein. We need to focus on calories. So when thinking about protein intake, you also have to think about the number of calories it delivers. So if you're taking a protein supplement, that give you about 20 grams of protein at 100 calories. Two cups of low fat chocolate milk would give you 16 grams of protein and 280 calories. And then when you look here at these lean cuts of meat, you'll get about three and a half, sorry, three and a half to four ounces um, per, for around 100 to 200 calories and pretty low fat. But then if we look at some of these plant-based sources like mixed nuts or peanut butter to get 24 grams of protein, so to hit that maximal protein synthesis, that would be around 560 calories. So it's also important to think about our calorie intake. Oops, this should have been the last slide that came out of order. But some of the health benefits of dietary proteins include increased weight loss, improved body composition, improved blood lipid levels, good cholesterol. They make us feel fuller longer. We it can have decreased muscle loss with age, increased calorie burning, and increased calorie burning. So next week, we'll um, have a guest speaker on the science of high protein diets with Josh Hudson, like I mentioned, from UAMS, who was trained at Purdue. And in the lab he came from, they do a lot of work with higher protein diets during weight loss. Um, so to summarize, and hopefully you start to understand the difference between essential and amino acids and non-essential amino acids. And this will help you explain, understand the differences between high quality and low quality proteins. Understanding all the different functions of protein in the body and the recommended intake for each person. But there are some key points to remember about protein. Um, more protein does not equal more muscle. The only way to get more muscle is to participate in uh, resistance training and exercise. All protein is not created equal in terms of availability of amino acids or quantity of amino acids. Um, eating more protein isn't better unless you're reducing carbohydrate intake. Um, and more protein doesn't keep your weight down. It's total amount of calories you eat in physical activity that help with that. So um, I'm happy to take any questions. Let me exit my presentation and stop sharing so I can see the chat. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, thank, thank you. you. This is Bridget. I okay. have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, I noticed whenever I calculate with the 0.8 um, multiplier for my protein, it's rather low compared to the 30 grams that you were indicating in the chart. So what are you recommending? Are you re recommending more than 1.2? grams per kilogram? No, I would say, so I usually think of it in terms of total calories eaten. So I say around 30% of your calories should be protein. Okay. Um, and that 30 grams of protein, I mean, that's an average, so that includes males. Okay. So I would say, you know, but 0.8 grams is just that minimum for maintaining nitrogen balance. Right. And I mean, I think when we talk about sort of the functional benefits of protein, it would equate out to around 1.2 grams per kilogram ideal body weight, which should be between 30 to 35 percent of calories. But I think it's more about also, um, it depends on your goal, but if your goal is weight loss or some of these health benefits, um, removing those processed carbs for every gram of protein you add and taking out, that's where we start to see these changes in health benefits. So okay. I would argue, like, our, like I study particularly the branch chain amino acids. So we do know you need around like 2.8 grams of leucine per meal. And you would get that with like your 25 to 30 grams of protein per meal. And I mean, and it's, you have to put some thought into it. And when you think about breakfast, like thinking around the traditional breakfast food mindset, it, it can be difficult to reach that 30 gram threshold. But I also recommend, um, 
Like I think whey protein supplementation, I'm not a big supplement advocate, but it is a way, especially with aging, because as we age, it becomes more difficult to chew some proteins. Like whey protein is a cheap and decent way to get a complete protein in your diet. Right. So would you say it's probably the same for children, just sticking with that 30% also, because I deal with a lot of youth programs. So, I mean, that's a great question. So we do do some studies with kids and like, I try to push protein on my son. He's six. And I mean, honestly, if I tell him to eat it, he's going to like throw a fit no matter what it is. Even if it was a Skittle, he'd like argue why he shouldn't eat it. So, um, we, so the study we are doing in children we look at high protein breakfasts and we find with normal weight kids, it really doesn't matter what they eat. They have like the same post meal response as far as like metabolism goes because they're growing and they're healthy. They're usually physically active. They can eat whatever is coming their way. Um, but when we talk about oh, kids with overweight or obesity, just increasing the protein in breakfast to 30%, you see that they're like fuller, longer, and they, and they um, eat less, they burn more calories. So I think with kids, because they are still in this growing phase, it's different than adults. But then you do see like one of my sort of colleagues outside the U of A looks at kids and like concentration and things and kids who have higher protein breakfast tend to perform better and have a longer attention span in the morning at school. Um, but I think, you know, no one's really done research in children. So it's not known, but I would say like if I was going to, I would prefer like giving a child maybe a string cheese or a yogurt versus like chips. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was trying to go by our handout for the 30 grams of protein for my son at the beginning of the year and he's nine and it was like, no, there's no way he's going to eat all that. <laughs> and this 30 grams is really for adults. Right. Really yeah. Like that, all that data also comes from like to prevent muscle loss with aging. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. So, um, and so like that, so I know Elizabeth Borstein, who spoke a couple weeks ago on fat, she's actually doing these studies right now with these nitrogen balance studies in children to figure out like the diet, what the balance of amino acids should be like in, in growing kids. And so we work together on some of that. The problem is it's like into the unknown. And it's really hard to get these kind of, because they're pretty invasive studies, so it's really hard to do them in children to figure out these numbers. And I know she also is kind of thinking, because there is some sort of change where it looks like high protein within infancy can actually have negative impacts on health later, too much protein, like risk for risk on obesity. So one of the questions for research scientists is we focus a lot on aging, but where is the point in life where we should really actually be preventative um, yeah, so I mean, the, the kids, it's unknown, but keep in mind, 30%, 30 grams would be based for like 150, 180 pound male. So like a petite female, maybe only need 20 to 25 grams. So do y'all have some handy recipes for things that fit into this category? <laughs> we do, um, we have made some fast facts during the last Defend 1.0, but we have recipe books we use for studies. I can reach Angela, who's not on the call today. I can ask her to pull some of her recipes and maybe put them, make them into a fast fact. But a lot of it, because when we study, th when we study protein, we usually use whey protein because it's pretty consistent and we get it from a supplier that supplies to food companies. So it's not the protein you would see on the shelf. And, um, we just come up with, there's a, there's actually, there's this company, I'm not advertising for them, but it's called Bipro, B-I-P-R-O. They have hundreds of recipes of things you can do with whey protein that beyond a smoothie. So if that's kind of your way of getting more protein supplementation, I highly recommend, I mean, some of their things we've tried are gross, but there's a lot of really good recipes. Um, but we can put together a fast fact on like protein snacks, ideas for like protein, more ideas for protein breakfasts, things like that. Because I think breakfast is the meal people struggle with the most. And one of the other struggles seems to be like non-processed food. Right. So I can send my child a beef jerky, but that's not really what I want him to eat necessarily. So it is really hard to find wholesome, nutritious. Yeah, and lunchbox food. food. Right. Um, 
Oh, so, um, and so like I actually had this business idea last year about making more wholes. It would be processed because it would be lunchbox ready, but like more healthy, higher protein, like breakfast type grab and go foods. And we surveyed a bunch of families in Fayetteville and like people seemed to know that eating healthy in the morning was important, but they didn't care. They'd rather just have something their kid would eat because they thought any breakfast is better than no breakfast. Um, so I think there's a need. There's totally a need out there and need people to fill it. And yeah, and Debbie is also, I see Debbie Baker is sharing a lot of great um, videos or links. And then I have one question about protein concentrate versus protein isolate. So yeah, you're right. So protein concentrate is one level of price processing and you often find protein, whey protein concentrate or anything that's in concentrate form will be a little less expensive than something that's in isolate form. So isolate is just a purer, um, form of the of the protein or whatever you're buying but I think in the end if you don't want to spend the money on a whey protein isolate the concentrate should, concentrate should be perfectly fine so and the one question is how would I use whey in my diet as a supplement for protein as well as actual food sources so that's where I would go back so Pinterest is also a wealth of information for like tried and true recipes. That's where we go a lot when we're developing recipe books for the studies, because there are some people out there that have tried all these combinations. Um, so yeah, I think it's, um, like we've made quiches with whey protein. We've made a lot of different things on um, protein. So how would you use whey to supplement in addition to actual food sources? So I would find a meal or a snack time where you get really hungry or if you're a grab and go kind of breakfast person and maybe make a smoothie in the morning and use whole foods. But then again, if you can get the protein from your diet from whole foods, I fully support that. But I know in today's society, it's not that easy. So I think whey is an easy alternative. Um, would consuming boiled eggs be healthier in regards to protein denaturation. So I think protein den denaturation is just part of the cooking process. So boiling it versus frying it or scrambling it. Um, it's not going to impact the amino acids that your body sees. So regardless, it's not going to change the structure of those amino acids that make up those protein and eggs. It's just an example of how like you have a liquid and then you cook it. So it's denaturing and changing the structure. And now you have more of a solid. Um, and what are the health issues associated with cholesterol oxidation? So I don't actually know that question about cholesterol oxidation, but more and more research is actually coming out that eggs do not impact your cholesterol levels. And it's really hard for diet in general to change your cholesterol one way or the other, and except for like, I think saturate, high saturated or trans fat intake. Um, and intermittent fasting folks say don't eat anything in the morning. Many say they have more energy. So again, um, intermittent fasting, which is, you know, there's all kinds. There's intermittent fasting, time-restricted feeding. Um, my guess would be that the energy is coming from reduced calorie intake and weight loss um, and more mindful eating. So, I mean, the so the breakfast debate is out there. Like some people, some research says yes. Some people say doesn't matter, but there is a lot of data showing that people who skip breakfast, breakfast skipping is associated with overweight and obesity. It's not cause and effect. Um, and we do know like people who don't eat breakfast do consume more calories throughout the day. But I think the difference with intermittent fasting is probably you're not getting that late night snacking and you're yeah, eating less, losing weight and feeling better. Um, and like I said, if I, this, so this really isn't supposed to be about high protein diets, but about protein quality and quantity. But I think one reason do, people do feel better if they're on like a weight loss diet or an exercise protein combination is because they're exercising, they're losing weight, and they're overall, you know, having more energy. Not using intermittent fasting every day, maybe a couple of days a week. Yeah. So I think, again, you have to find whatever, like, eating pattern fits your lifestyle and makes you feel good. Um, and what a supplement for nail, hair and nails. So I do not normally advocate supplements. Um, 
because there is no research really supporting a lot of the a lot of supplements. There is a lot of research on whey protein supplementation, but even those studies are short term. You know, no one's really looking at what happens if you drink whey every day for 12, 16 weeks or a year or something like that. Um, Yes, and I think Josh should hopefully have a really interesting lecture, uh, lecture next week on a lot of the science that's out there. And just like everything, there are pros and cons. Um, you know, some people just, it's not for them. But I really, in the end, it's really about calorie intake and physical activity. But I think, you know, protein that we know is important for preserving muscle mass and muscle is what's important for as we age to prevent frailty. Muscle burns more calories than fat um, and things like that. Um, what are thoughts on creatine? So people do swear by creatine. I think the problem with creatine is they haven't yet shown, and maybe Dr. Howie, if she's still on the call, would know better than me. I think um, creatine does bulk people up, but I don't know if it's in the form of muscle mass. Some people say it's because of water retention, because usually when you stop supplementing with protein, um, that the, or supplementing with creatine, the bulk goes away. Um, but there needs to be more research. And again, you know, you have to make, make sure what you're buying when we talked about supplements last week. Um, is a pure supplement. And then, you know, can high protein consumption impact kidneys? So there's been lots of, you know, big studies of the literature and looking at high protein diets on kidney function. And in a healthy person, there is no link between um, high protein intake and poor kidney function. But if you are, um, you know, type 2 diabetic or you do have kidney issues, um, that's where it can become a problem. And pea protein, I think pea protein, actually the, a lot of the pea proteins that are out there, they kind of, some people have an issue with the taste or the texture, but they do have a pretty good amino acid profile. And same with soy protein. Um, so yeah, they are, they are like every year, because I think the protein supplement industry is like a $5 billion or something ridiculous industry, they are working always to improve. And especially with the push for eating more plant to making optimal uh, powdered plant sources of protein that they may supplement in with additional amino acids. But you know, like when you think about plant versus animal protein, it's also about um, the digestibility. So amino acids from an animal protein source are going to be more readily available than amino acids from um, a plant protein. I think I said that right. And um, with digestion and absorption and things like that. Um, yeah. Any other questions? I think we went a little bit over, so sorry about that. But yeah, hopefully next week, Josh will be able to answer a bunch of questions to, about some of the science behind, behind all that. And we'll work on getting some meals and snack ideas and recipes together by next week for the fast facts. Okay. Well, that's it. I'm gonna um, stop recording. And I appreciate everyone taking the time to join Defend today, and we'll hopefully see you um, next week. Thanks for the compliments, everyone. We appreciate it. Have a great day.